I'll be focusing more on the economic theory than on the uh, what actually caused the last crisis because we're going to remain blind if we use economic theory, which is blind to what causes financial crises. That's what we're still doing. And uh, I'm not pleading for an ideological shift here. I'm pleading for a realist shift. There's ideology built into the foundations of neoclassical economics in much the same way there is to Marxist economics. We need realism, not ideology. And I think we're still living with an ideologically based theory. Uh, I want to give you an idea of just how blind economics is in general by referring to a very recent uh, article in the Wall Street Journal by two economists, Edward Prescott and Leah Harnian, saying how the good times can roll on if we continue deregulating labour markets. It's fundamentally their advice. Now, for those of you who don't know who Edward Prescott and Leah Harnian are, Edward Prescott got the Nobel Prize for inventing real business cycle modelling, which of course is the foundation of DSG modelling today. And Leah Harnian is both a researcher associate of his and uh, an advisor to the Minneapolis Fed still. Now, so we've got people with serious positions of status, and of course, they have their own serious explanation for what caused the crisis in 2008. You'll be pleased to know the financial crisis was not caused by the financial system. Because when you ask, when they were posing themselves what caused both the Great Depression and the Great Recession, they both targeted labour market changes, which unfortunately they couldn't identify what they were but they had to be massive. So Prescott, in a paper called uh, Observations on the Great Depression, said that he's led to the view there must have been a fundamental change in labour market institutions to explain why workers decided to work less for the, the decade of the 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> and Ahani in the same explanation for 2007-2009, because for some reason workers weren't responding to the marginal product of labour. They should have been deciding to work more. Instead, for some strange reason, they decided to work less. Now, they both uh, think, identify what they thought did not cause the crisis. And that's where, of course, the financial crisis was not caused by the financial system. Banking, money and credit played no role in the crisis, according to these experts. And Prescott, in studying his 1999 paper, said that given the evidence against monetary or banking explanations, dot, 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 Ahanian refers to a figure, and I'm going to show you that in a moment, showing the level of bank credit relative to nominal GDP, showing it was at an all-time high at the end of 2008. And while it declined, it was still at a higher level than any point before 2000 and middle of 2008. So therefore, he could ignore it. And this is his figure four. Look at the numbers on the left-hand side. That is, yes, it's called credit in the BIS series. Bill, please see if you can have to revise the terminology. That is not credit. That is the outstanding level of private sector debt compared to GDP. I define credit properly as the rate of change of that level. Now, what is going on here is as someone who is an associate of a Nobel Prize winner, with an article published in the, one of the top 10 journals, Journal of Economic Perspectives, and therefore passed the referees at that journal and the editor as well. Confuse distance with speed, <laughs> fundamentally. So if you come to a court, look, look, a court case and said, I was only 30 kilometres from Paris, so I wasn't speeding. <laughs> now the judge would in that case say, you were doing 240 kilometres per hour, you were speeding. It's that failure to understand money. Now how on earth can you become a leading economist and fail to understand money? It's because money, debt and credit play no role in conventional economics. An entire coterie of academics and professional economists don't understand the system that generates the economy in which we live. So that's why we need the realism. Now, to give you a, a point of what happens if you take exactly that same data and you understand you're looking at the level of debt and not the rate of change of debt, what happens when you differentiate it? So here's the same data, so a slightly different time series, different maximum level on the left-hand scale. Uh, and that's the, that's the level of, and that was what warned me of the crisis approaching. I started warning in December of 2005 that that rate of growth of the level of debt compared to GDP could not continue. When it slowed down, there'd be a crisis. So I started warning, I think back December 19, 2005, I was getting on the media at that point. So let's take a look at the rate of change of that level of debt and see what credit actually was, which of course Ahanian and uh, um, Periscott both dismissed as an explanation <laughs> for both the Great Recession and the Great Depression. This is credit.
Now I think you can see the problem. It peaked at 7.5%. It fell to minus 9. Okay. On the data he's using there, I get a large return around using a different data set. So from plus 7.5 to minus 9%, that's what caused the crisis. Everything else we've talked about so far, I'm sorry mm. to say, is talking about the icing on the cake. I want to talk about the cake. And why did we not see it? It's because we have an explanation of how the economy operates that leaves out what makes the cake, which is the monetary system. So let's now take a look at what does that cake tell you about macroeconomics, because again, there was a dismissal of the importance of credit monetary explanations. And even though I've been talking about the banking system in this entire uh, conference, we haven't yet talked about what they create, which is credit, credit and debt. This is the correlation of credit and unemployment in America. Now, if you want the correlation coefficient from 1990, the correlation coefficient there is minus 0.93. Okay. That's what we've been ignoring. That's what the conventional economic series ignored in the lead up to the crisis. That's why they were collecting the data and not even understanding it. So what caused the financial crisis and the Great Depression beforehand was too high a level of private debt and a collapse in credit. That's what caused them both. And you can't understand them using the equilibrium thinking and the non-monetary thinking that dominates conventional economics. You have to go to an, a system dynamics way of thinking. We've mentioned systems quite a few times in this, in this conference, but I want to go further and show what that looks like. And you need to have something which is dynamic non-equilibrium. If we stick with equilibrium thinking, we'll run right into the next crisis. We'll mistake an iceberg for a nice fluffy cloud on the horizon, which is what we did last time. So I want to show you how simple it is to build models that actually include banks, debt and money in the dynamics. And this is a very simple model derived by simply taking the employment rate, the wage share of GDP and private debt. Differentiate those definitions with respect to time. Feed in incredibly simple linear behaviours. Nothing complicated, nothing about expectations and so on and so forth. Simply a linear dependence upon uh, the employment rate for a, a wage change similar for investment on the rate of profit and debt financing investment. And what you get is a system which can be stable if private debt and credit remain low, but a high level of both leads to a crisis. This is the model running if the system has got a low propensity to invest and you converge to a nice dynamic equilibrium. This is the model with a rising level of private debt, a high, too high level of desire to invest, which is a strange thing to say. And what you see, you get a great moderation followed by a crisis. And you get rising inequality as well, and a breakdown given by too much debt. That's how simple it is to get a realistic vision of how capitalism functions when you have a financial sector which is not properly constrained. Similarly, again, if you look at how banks behave, the neoclassical model of how banks behave has them as intermediaries. And massive changes in the level of debt and the rate of lending have no effect really of any significance on GDP. You can ignore banks. If you then modify that model and say, well, banks actually are lenders. They're not introduction agencies. They are originators of debt. And it just takes a few changes to the double entry bookkeeping behind that model to make those changes, which I've recorded myself doing here about twice normal speed, but it takes about 30 seconds to go from a model of loanable funds to a model of what I call bank originated money and debt. And when you do that, the changes that I was showing in the rate of lending in the previous simulation, which had no impact upon macroeconomic variables, now determine them. That's the change in vision we need to have. Mm. So we need more than one way to model the economy. We cannot, yes, okay, continue developing DSG, continue fiddling with them. But let's also build complex systems models. Let's build models based on machine learning and neural networks, which are far more accurate on, in out-of-sample forecasting than any mainstream or non-mainstream model, not just DSG. If one way of thinking about the economy let us down in the past, then we shouldn't just use one way in the future. Thank you. Thank you.